Hey everyone, it's Ricky Molina from the Ricky Molina YouTube channel and RickyMolinaProductions.com. Glad you could be with me today. Today I'd like to do a product review of two masterclasses that I was able to attend over the past year or so. They're from Masterclass.com and as you can see from this website, it is just jam-packed with really interesting courses in many different fields, artistic, uh, culinary, film, writing, uh, music, entertainment. I mean, you've got everyone from like David Lynch, Martin Scorsese, Ron Howard, Jodie Foster, Werner Herzog from film, for example. And in music, you've got everyone from like Timbaland to Herbie Hancock, uh, Carlos Santana, Armin Van Buren, Christina Aguilera. Among the film score producers, the two guys I'm going to talk about today are Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman. And so this video is a product review of my experience taking master classes with Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman. I'd like to say at the outset that I'm really grateful to masterclass.com for having put together these incredible instructional classes. Um, and you couldn't have chosen two radically different film composers in the field. They're both highly successful. Hans Zimmer has written over 150 film scores, which is absolutely insane. And Danny Elfman has produced over 100 film scores. So they're very experienced, successful film score writers, very different in style, as we'll see. Now you've probably heard Hans Zimmer's music all over the place. Everything from like Gladiator, Interstellar, Inception, The Dark Knight, Batman, etc, etc. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's endless. And I have a picture in the upper right here on this slide of a giant whale breaching the ocean. And in terms of animals, to characterize the music of these two composers, I like to consider Hans Zimmer's music to be somewhat of a giant whale. Um, very, very heavy stuff that sort of submerges the depths of the ocean and, you know, pushing the undercurrents and really churning it up down there. You may consider Hans Zimmer to be somewhat of the Led Zeppelin of film score writing. He's that heavy at times. Hans Zimmer was born in Frankfurt, Germany, which is kind of like the money center city of Germany. It's similar to London or New York, if you will. He really didn't grow up, you know, with that much musical training in the sense of not having mastered the piano or the guitar, say, for example. In fact, Danny Elfman as well. Really, they're not trained musicians as such. They're not these child prodigy musicians who can whip across, you know, some Mozart or Bachmaninoff piece uh, at their will. No, the keyboard learning came much later and they were not considered outstanding musicians in their own right. So for all you want to be composers out there, you shouldn't let that hinder you if you're not necessarily that technically proficient at your instrument. After studying briefly at a um, music and art school in, in Switzerland, Hans Zimmer migrated to London where he soon became active in some uh, synth bands, electronic music bands, and then he hooked up with Stanley Myers, who was a film score composer at the time, and they combined forces to create a company to write music for film. And so Stanley Myers, who is most noted for his piece uh, Cavatina, which was highlighted in The Deer Hunter, if you remember that tragic film about Vietnam with Robert De Niro as the main protagonist, um, you know, that is a beautiful uh, classical guitar piece that John Williams recorded for the film, Stanley Myers became a mentor and an influence on Hans Zimmer's compositional development. In contrast, Danny Elfman did not have a mentor, which says a lot in itself. In the masterclass, Hans Zimmer talks about his early influences, uh, essentially Mahler, uh, which if you remember was this post-Beethoven romantic composer very, very uh, slow-moving, uh, beautiful orchestrations with strings. You should check out his Symphony No. 5 particularly. And Hans was also influenced by the operas that he had to attend weekly when with his parents. You know, you could just picture this young lad, Hans, you know, having to tag along with his parents who want to go see, you know, Verdi and Puccini at some big opera hall in Frankfurt, for example. But Hans also says that he was greatly influenced by Ennio Morricone, who is the spaghetti western composer, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, once upon a time in the west, etc., etc. Um, you know, he says that having seen some early western uh, movies, that drew him in 
uh, to wanting to become a film composer. But I think this Morricone influence was more of a motivational, inspirational thing. Um, if you listen to Hans's music, I couldn't picture anything that really resembles Morricone, actually. Maybe in terms of structure, uh, finales and climaxes, things like that, perhaps. Um, but musically, I don't really see that much overlap with Morricone and Hans Zimmer. I see more of an overlap with uh, some of his other influences that he notes. Uh, Giorgio Moroder, for example, uh, the composer for Midnight Express and a lot of synth disco stuff from the 70s. Uh, you can see the synth sounds coming through a lot in Hans Zimmer's work and sound design and sampling and things like that, which sort of emanated from Marauder. Another composer that he doesn't talk about too much, but I detect a heavy influence, is uh, Philip Glass. Now, Philip Glass is this composer who really expanded on um, the whole concept of ostinati, uh, which are repetitive rhythmic patterns in music. And you can see this sort of, you get this sort of loop sense when you listen to Philip Glass a lot. And that comes through a great deal in Hans Zimmer's music. As experienced as he is, you can imagine that Hans Zimmer has worked with virtually every significant uh, big-time film producer and director in Hollywood. And he's been celebrated quite a bit, um, receiving 11 Academy Award nominations and winning in 1994 the Academy Award for uh, The Lion King. In contrast, Danny Elfman didn't win any Academy Awards for his film scoring, but he did receive four Academy Award nominations. You know, which I find to be a little bit uh, unfair in a sense, uh, because Danny Elfman's music, as we'll talk about soon, is quite enlightening and, and beautiful in its own right. I think in contrast with Danny Elfman, uh, Hans Zimmer is less of a performer. You know, he did appear uh, with the band The Buggles, uh, Trevor Horn's 1980s new wave synth pop kind of uh, jumpy band. Uh, you may remember the song Video Killed the Radio Star that Trevor Horn composed and produced. And Hans Zimmer is there in the background, you know, playing the keys with Thomas Dolby in that video. You know, but really Hans Zimmer is more of a studio composer than a performer. Whereas Danny Elfman starts out, you know, with his older brother uh, creating a, a band called the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo and doing quite a few shows. You know, Elfman played uh, electric guitar, rhythm guitar, and he was accompanied with his brother and also Steve Bartek lead guitarist for Oingo Boingo, who eventually becomes one of Elfman's key guys for orchestrating film scores. If I were to characterize Hans's style um, of composition, and you can draw your own conclusions for yourselves, but I find it to be very broad brushed, ambient music, supportive music, and as suggested earlier, heavy music. Hans Zimmer loves the minor keys. You know, D minor is like, you know, his favorite key. It supports the music a great deal. It's almost as if Hans is giving his all and pouring his heart out into these like heavy, simplified progressions. They're not complicated progressions at all. It's just very heavy and developed um, in terms of the sound design and the scope. I think one of the reasons he's so successful in film scoring in Hollywood is because his music does underlie the music, gives it some heavy weight and significance that wouldn't be there with other composers. As I tried to suggest earlier with the Philip Glass influence, there's a lot of forceful buildup in Hans Zimmer's music, pulsating ostinati. Now, an ostinato is simply a repeating rhythmic pattern, so it's clearly apparent in such epic scenes, for example, where there's battle, and you know, you hear these heavy storm drums, dum 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 Or, you know, when there's a chase scene in the wild, you see a pack of wolves attacking this poor reindeer or caribou in the Arctic, and it's like dun 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 Well, those are ostinati, okay? And, you know, Hans Zimmer did not invent ostinati, nor did Philip Glass. In film scoring history, I think Bernard Herrmann was the one who really brought ostinati to the fore. But it's all over Hans Zimmer's music. I mean, a lot of his progressions are just repetitive loops. I'm thinking about the Cornfields, for example, that piece from Interstellar that constantly builds. I mean, it's like a, a force that drives and climaxes at the end and it sort of leaves you there and it's like an incredible powerful slow but obstinate progression 
And as mentioned, Hans's electronic synth sounds are prevalent throughout his compositions. He's perfectly willing to mix and fuse the electronic uh, sampled sounds and synth sounds with the organic orchestral sounds. One of the things to note about Hans Zimmer is that he strikes me as being an incredible team player. He's like this mentor now, um, this father to an offshoot of, of young protege film composers. Everyone from Henry Gregson Williams, uh, John Powell, uh, Ramin Jawadi, I mean, they all got their lucky shots um, by having had the privilege to work with Hans Zimmer in his music production studio in LA. I mean, if we look at all these films that I've selected here in the slide, you can see everything from like Gladiator, um, where he's, you know, sort of brought up Lisa Gerard and Klaus Badelt. Klaus Badelt is also uh, working with Hans on, on Invincible, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, one of the films, The Pledge. Hans has worked with Junkie XL, who's the sound designer guy from Holland, on Batman Superman, for example. And he's done some really great work on Blue Planet 2 and Planet Earth 2, uh, sort of cultivating the talents of David Fleming and Jacob Shea and Yasha Klebe, for example. And it seems as though Hans is very efficient at bringing in his protégés to help clean up some pieces. I mean, if you look at the discography, um, the filmography and discography of Hans Zimmer, you'll see that he's replaced many composers who simply were either fired or died out on projects. It's like, you know, leave it to Hans. He'll take care of it. He'll clean up the film score for us. My favorite works by Hans Zimmer are probably, and I didn't select Gladiator or Lion King because, you know, there are other composers who contributed to those two films. So I purposely selected music that I think was exclusively Hans. And in doing my review for this video, I listened to a bunch of soundtracks. I personally can't stand the Batman movies and the Avengers and the Transformers and all of these like video game like type of movies where it's like dun 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 you know heroic type of fantasy stuff it doesn't really ring my bell. I get more carried away with some of the more delicate uh, orchestral developments that take place in films like um, The Last Samurai, for example, where Hans works with Edward Zwick, for example, in 2003. Da Vinci Code is an interesting film score as well, uh, where Hans works with a director, Ron Howard, who, by the way, also has a course on masterclass.com on film directing, which is kind of cool. And I especially like the film score to Frost Nixon, which is a 2008 Ron Howard film. You know, the impeachment proceedings, and then the, the ultimate resignation uh, of Richard Nixon in, in the early 70s due to Watergate. The music here is just really kind of stripped down. It's not, you know, this Wagnerian bombastic type of thing. It's really very selective in terms of the instruments. It's fascinating to listen to and how it's kept kind of on the edge. Uh, he never lets down in terms of the tension in the film and the seriousness of it, and yet it is beautiful music to listen to. This whole concept of the Philip Glass loop-de-loop -loop thing, I just wanted to talk about briefly, and it's more prevalent in Hans Zimmer's music than Danny Elfman's. You know, if you're familiar with M.C. Escher, uh, there's an interesting book called Gödel Escher Bach, which I read decades ago, uh, written by Douglas Hofstadter, where he talks about this interrelationship between the artwork of M.C. Escher, where you have these tessellations, these art tessellations, repeated patterns, geometric patterns. And then the staircase, for example, you know, you see this loop-de-loop -loop going on, uh, staircase, these guys walking up and down these staircases, and, and you're never quite sure where it starts and where it ends. That's sort of like the way Hans Zimmer and Philip Glass write a lot of their music. It's very loopy. And the beauty in the music is, of course, not the loop itself, but how you develop the loop and write variations on it. And so you have to ask the question, are repetitive loop patterns really a sign of freedom of expression or just the opposite? And one could argue that, you know, repetitive patterns in music or in anything are kind of mild forms of insanity when you think of it. You may recall one definition of insanity being, you know, 
doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different outcome. Um, well, if you listen to anything that much over and over again, in my opinion, it's almost like overkill. And I personally don't like overkill in music. I don't like overkill in anything for that matter. In contrast to the giant whale that's breaching the ocean surface or submerging into the depths of the undercurrents of the ocean, as is the case with Hans Zimmer, I like to view Danny Elfman's music as more of a chameleon, a karma chameleon type of music where, um, you know, he changes on a dime. In contrast to Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman is from LA. And I think it's absolutely astounding that Danny Elfman didn't have any mentors as Hans Zimmer did, or even Mozart had Handel as his mentor. And Beethoven even studied under Handel. Well, Danny Elfman didn't study under anybody. He kind of learned everything on his own. And for that, you have to give him a ton of credit. And that doesn't mean that Danny didn't listen to any, you know, big time classical composers. He certainly did. And among his favorites that he cites in the masterclass are Igor Stravinsky. You may remember his uh, Rite of Spring, for example, and Prokofiev, two Russian composers. And I think it's very interesting to note that Danny Elfman has Igor Stravinsky and Prokofiev as two of his favorite composers. I mean, we're not talking about Beethoven, Mozart, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky, Debussy, or any of these greats. We're talking about two rather esoteric, you know, out-of-the-box composers who happen to be great orchestrators, by the way. If you want to learn how to orchestrate, I think you got to listen to some of these Russian composers. Everyone from Rimsky-Korsakov, for example, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Petrushka. I mean, Petrushka has some wonderful orchestrated moments, as does Prokofiev's work. You know, Prokofiev, of course, is famous for Peter and the Wolf, for educating students about orchestration, but also his symphonies and Lieutenant Kijay, for example, you know, wonderful orchestrated works that are worth listening to. And I get the impressions of Danny Elfman just poured over their uh, compositions and, and tore them apart. Incidentally, that's something that Hans Zimmer highly recommends for up and coming film score composers. You know, you should take your favorite compositions from your favorite composers and just study every little angle of them. You know, the, the phrasing, the development, the bass pattern, melodic interreactions with the chordal uh, changes and selection of instruments as well, of course. But, you know, Danny Elfman was also highly influenced by 1930s New York jazz music. Uh, there was a period in his life where he, he refused to get into, like, rock and roll in the 50s, 60s. Kind of prided himself on this 1930s retro uh, music from Harlem, particularly the Apollo the Cotton Club. And he tried to bring that into his music uh, with Oingo Boingo. I think there's also a big influence from cartoon music in Danny Elfman. Not so much the slapstick kind of you know things like that. There is some of that too, but in a very sort of tasteful way. Cartoonish in the sense that it's light and it's very upbeat and playful. For example, Danny Elfman wrote the Simpsons theme, the opening theme. You know. Um, and he says he was influenced by the Flintstones scene where uh, the family Flintstones driving back into Bedrock, you know, Dino in the backseat, Barney Rubble, etc. And uh, Betty and everyone, you know, that's what he says influenced him to write the opening theme for The Simpsons, which is quite interesting. But it's this playfulness and also being able to turn on a dime in cartoon music that you don't see anywhere else. And that is definitely present in Danny Elfman's music. He, he shifts from one gear to the next. All of a sudden, out of the blue, there comes a different modulation or different phrasing or just a change of tone, a change of spirit. And that's why I use the image of the chameleon as an example for uh, a good animal creature from the wild to describe Danny Elfman's music. Another big thing about Danny Elfman's music is that it is very rhythmic. Uh, because when he was much younger, in his teens, he accompanied his brother to uh, West Africa, where he was just so influenced by the rhythmic tribal beat patterns and uh, playing these percussive instruments. There was a gamelan room in a music school 
that he crashed every now and then, and he would just like play this gamelan for hours. And even today, Danny Elfman loves to play his marimba phone to get like you know rhythmic pattern ideas for his films. And I think that sort of originates from his influence of African music. It's also interesting to note uh, that every great composer has a great director that he or she has hooked up with over the years to write music for. And uh, in Danny Elfman's case, it's Tim Burton. In fact, Tim Burton's the guy who actually convinced Danny Elfman to get involved in film scoring to begin with uh, when he wanted to put together his uh, first Pee Wee Herman film, uh, you know, he called on Danny Elfman and said, you know, I've seen your work with Oingo Boingo, and I think you would be the perfect film score uh, composer for my new film, uh, Pee Wee Herman. And at first, Danny Elfman was reluctant. He was like, who, me? You know, I don't know the first thing about composition. But in his masterclass, you know, he says that it took about a week for him to finally uh, come around to the whole concept because he's like, if I don't do it, they could just hire somebody else. So I may as well give it a shot. And that's how he got started. Uh, in the whole film score industry. One of the things that comes out in Danny Elfman's masterclass is the importance of working with music editors and directors and also orchestrators. Danny Elfman's main go-to guy for orchestration is Steve Bartek, who, as mentioned earlier, was the lead guitarist for Oingo Boingo. And you know, one of the things that really impresses me about Danny Elfman's music is the orchestration. And it really comes through in such great orchestrations like for Hitchcock, for example, which I absolutely love listening to, and also Goodwill Hunting, which I think the orchestration is really just amazing. And also The Grinch, which is this light, you know, Christmas uh, animation, uh, really, really fun to watch and to listen to. Orchestrating for cartoon music is not easy. There's a lot going on. So kudos to Steve Bartek. And of course, the other thing you got to mention that sets him apart from other film composers is that Danny Elfman has red hair. Anyone with red hair has got to make a statement in some way, shape, or form in his lifetime. So among my favorite Danny Elfman film scores would be Goodwill Hunting. I hear the guitars coming through a lot and, uh, you know, these string-plucked instruments that you don't really hear in Hans Zimmer's music because he's a keyboard guy. You know, anyone who is a guitarist, I mean, think of the orchestration work that Steve Bartek does as well. Hats off and kudos to guitarists who can make it as composers and orchestrators in the film industry. But something about the plucked instrument that you don't get with a keyboard. I don't care what kind of samples you have out there to, to sound like acoustic guitar music. It ain't like playing a guitar. There's just something very organic about coming from the heart. It's like it comes from your chest. With a keyboard, you're sitting down and it's like in front of you. With a guitar, you actually have it sitting on your lap and it becomes part of you. And so I really favor guitar compositions in many ways. That's not to say that I'm not envious of keyboardists, because I am. Their ability to play extensions and chords uh, with 10 fingers on a keyboard as opposed to the only four fingers that are available on a fretboard. Now, guitarists, we can also bar chords as well, so we get a little more mileage, but there's something to be said for being able to access 10 fingers across uh, keys and being able to spread out the registers high and low that you can't physically do or achieve on a guitar. Some other famous works that you may have uh, recognized from Danny Elfman include like The Grinch, Men in Black, uh, Alice in Wonderland, Beetlejuice, Pee Wee Herman, as mentioned, Corpse Bride, Frankenweenie, Spider-Man, and The Red Dragon with Anthony Hopkins. And anytime you mention Anthony Hopkins, it's like, <sighs> One of the questions I was asking myself as I was preparing this slideshow was, uh, you know, would Hans Zimmer have ever been willing and interested in uh, writing the music for a Frankenweenie movie or Dumbo? You know, it just does not seem to jive with Hans's persona. They may be a little bit beneath his ego. Whereas Danny Elfman's attitude seems to be like, I love writing music for kids and for adults who want to be kids again and just recapture that childlike, playful spirit. I think that's definitely present in Danny Elfman. As different as these composers are, they share a lot of things in common. Neither of them learned to 
to become really seriously proficient at any one instrument. I mean, Danny Elfman happens to be a pretty decent keyboardist himself and guitarist, but neither of them are virtuosos by any means. Both did not study at, you know, incredible music school programs like Juilliard, Berkeley, USC, or these European academies, for example, which in some respects, one may argue, is a pretty good reason why they're so successful. There's something to be said for learning directly from the masters and then reinterpreting uh, the great compositions and throwing a spin on something yourself. I think if you're thinking outside the box, you're looking freshly at, at the material and the action of the film. And this is almost why both composers really hate listening to temp scores. Uh, they'd rather not listen to temp scores, you know, during spotting sessions. They may have to because that's what the director wants them to sort of build from, but um, they both hate temp scores. They don't want any preconceptions or interpretations that are going to force them into a particular corner. Another interesting thing of note is that they both played in new age groups from the 1980s. I mentioned the Buggles for Hans Zimmer and also Oingo Boingo uh, for Danny Elfman. As mentioned, they're both highly prolific composers. And as such, you can imagine, they must be masters at programming and scheduling their days. Danny Elfman talks about this a lot in his master class, uh, where he's like given two and a half months to three months to work on a project. So that's like 60 days. And he's got to like schedule his time slots uh, perfectly for each and every cue of the movie. Um, he's got his cues lined up. He's got his times and he knows the scenes and he's, you know, one day at a time sort of thing. Both courses come with workbooks or, um, you know, summaries, if you will. The Hans Zimmer workbook or course book has over 10 creative assignments and exercises. I think he put a lot of thought into that. And for that, I think we have to be really grateful. Danny's course book, in contrast, doesn't come with any assignments or exercises. Danny Elfman's course book comes with some suggested listening exercises, but no assignments as such. And by the way, when it comes to the assignments with the Hans Zimmer course, you can submit your compositional uh, creations to what is called the Hub, which is a community of students from the class who are sharing their compositions and, uh, you know, everybody's being constructive. Uh, the criticism is constructive and supportive. Now, I don't think you're going to get uh, Hans Zimmer like commenting on your piece necessarily um, or Danny Elfman, uh, but you can submit uh, your compositions. And I think if anything, that could give you some exposure as well. In the Danny Elfman class, there's a lot of emphasis on how to overcome rejection, uh, self-doubt, fear, and all these demons that are kind of running through your mind when working on a big time project, for example. Some of the key points and highlights from the two master classes, if I may share them with you, both of them have this, you can do this too type of attitude. If you really put your heart and time and energy into it, you know, as is the case with almost all of these master classes, they're very inspiring and motivating coming from the top. You know, once again, considering that both of these master film composers were not virtuosos of any instrument in particular, but seemed to be uh, pretty proficient at a wide range of instruments, but, but not really masters of any one particular instrument. That's inspiring in itself, I find. And it goes to show you that sometimes what's going on in your mind, the melodies and the rhythms and the, the bass development parts that are going on and originate, they all originate in your mind. And so that's inspiring in itself. I mean, who needs hands anymore to compose when you think about it? You can translate everything through a microphone and sing it into, uh, into a DAW and translate that into MIDI. You know, try it. it. It can work. I like the fact that in Hans Zimmer's course, he talks a lot about uh, creating a sound palette. Um, it's like he's painting with music. Uh, he talks a lot about light and darkness, uh, green light versus red light. What does that suggest? kind of like a Doppler effect of music when you think about it. Very fascinating how he gets inspired by the imagery on the screen to write his music. The Hans Zimmer Masterclass has a lot to say about character composition. How to write about a particular character protagonist. I mean, to some extent, you have to be somewhat of a psychoanalyst and interpret 
the innermost drives and tendencies of a particular character and bring that out through the music. And that's not always an easy task. You know, first and foremost for Hans Zimmer, it's about telling a story. And how do you tell a story? Well, you narrate a story usually, and it's conversational. And so there's always question and answer and conversation, but not always answering the question at first, raising it to another level, and then asking the question in a new light, etc., and sort of building and building uh, tension that way. As I mentioned, both courses have a lot to say about professional tips, working with directors in Hollywood, particularly working with editors, orchestrators, especially the trying experience of, you know, having to go through cuts, you know, at the end when they're sort of editing the movie and they're all of a sudden they've taken out this musically inspired scene and it's no longer there. Well, how do you then uh, take care of a transition from one moment to the next. You may have to go back to the laboratory, to the studio, and and recompose, you know, endings and beginnings of certain scenes so that it transitions more smoothly due to the fact that the film editors were in there chopping things to pieces. That's one of the challenges of writing music for film. I think Danny's course is more filled with the personable issues like, you know, frustrations, doubts, fears, um, rejection and how to deal with it. It's almost like he's like an older brother, uh, sort of like patting you on the back saying, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. Don't worry about rejection. You'll find your way. You will just got to get back on the horse and try harder and just keep going. But it's okay to fail. Don't be afraid of failure. It happens to the best. And that's one of the key messages that comes through Danny Elfman's masterclass. You don't want to come to the director with just one main musical idea, especially for an important scene. You may want to write three different cues uh, for the director when you sit down with him and you give him the choice and ask him which one he likes the best. And that's something that is also discussed, that you shouldn't just rely on your one and only cue. There should be some backup material uh, ready to go if necessary. You know, when it comes to specific instruments for motivation, inspiration, I think Hans Zimmer again is, you know, more the electronic guy. And he's going to talk about synth design, sound design, uh, samples and things like that. And, you know, getting involved with such programs as uh, samplers, Zebra, and all these synth uh, programs that are out there, Omnisphere, what have you. Uh, whereas Danny Elfman is coming more from the organic instrumental perspective. Um, so everything from banging on his marimba phone to the gamelan, uh, to drum kits, uh, cymbals, uh, plucking instruments and things like that. Um, you know, how to use different instruments for inspiration. I think from the organic perspective, Danny Elfman's more uh, specific about that than Hans's. I think another key point that uh, Danny Elfman talks about and he puts it better than I'm going to, but essentially it's, you know, how do you actually plan the arc of the music for writing music to film? And that can be a challenge because when you think about it, if you start from the very beginning, you may start to meander and you may end up somewhere totally different from where you want to. Then you have to start over again and recompose from different parts of the film. I think a better way to go about it and is brought out in Danny Elfman's uh, course is that, you know, you start with the end and you also try to locate key anchor points in the film, the most important uh, sensitive moments of the film. So maybe you have two, three uh, parts and then the conclusion. And then what Danny Elfman says is he just does whatever he wants to in between to connect the dots. Um, but at least he has those key moments that he spends a lot of time composing for at first. So those anchor points get a lot of time in the composition and development uh, phase of things. And then all the other stuff is basically filler and having fun in between connecting the dots. And that's uh, the Danny Elfman approach. And those filler parts may include variations on themes and motifs that can reappear and maybe they're emphasized during the anchor points. So there is a revisiting of um, motifs and themes. 
One of the things that Danny Elfman talks about more than Hans Zimmer is this whole idea of saving and preserving ideas when you get them. Who knows where you are? He talks about having attended his daughter's wedding. You know, in the middle of the ceremony, he's got this new musical idea, this epiphany comes to him. And he can't whip out his cell phone because it's going to be really discourteous. And and he can't go to the bathroom because it's an important moment in the wedding. So he's got to remember sort of, you know, keep that idea going into his head. And then he's finally able to break away later and get it down into his studio somehow. Another time he's talking about flying on this jet plane and he gets this musical inspiration and he's like taking multiple trips down to the bathroom to sing into his cell phone into the lavatory uh, so that he doesn't lose the idea. I mean, the lengths that composers go to to preserve their ideas and they're all worth saving. <clears throat> That's the message that you get. You should do anything it takes, even if it means like waking up in the middle of the friggin' night, but just save your ideas. You can always come back to them. And some of them are definitely worth coming back to. For $90 per course or $180 unlimited per year, I had the unlimited uh, subscription last year. And I just went back and bought the Danny Elfman course separately on its own for 90 bucks. I mean, how much do you think it would cost to get a Hans Zimmer or Danny Elfman into a Juilliard class to talk about film composition. It would be quite expensive to bring these guys in and then, uh, you know, having to matriculate into these programs as well. So for $90 for the course or 180 bucks a year for unlimited access, I think it's a bargain. And we should be grateful to the masterclass.com people for doing such a great job uh, providing the service for everybody. I mean, I have a few misgivings, uh, but they're not like, the end all be all. I think it would have been nice to actually take specific scene examples and, you know, where you have the composer talking about what he was thinking while he was composing. And then perhaps some of the experiences with the orchestration. I would have loved to have to get a little more detail, to get down and dirty with the scores, uh, for example. What am I thinking at this point? as a composer. Am I going to go for the minor key, the heavy or diminished chords, or am I going to sort of throw a curve at it? And here's an example of what I mean. Let's take an actual moment where, you know, it was a heavy scene, uh, but I threw a little bit of a curve. And how did I do that? Well, I used a certain instrument. Maybe I used a clarinet instead of, you know, horns. Maybe I used, you know, some counter melodies, or I kept things very soft and dynamics. Things like that I would have appreciated that were not discussed by either of the two teachers of the course. Two other misgivings that I like to share with you, they're not criticisms of the course as such, but it always struck me as I was preparing this presentation, why is it that Danny Elfman isn't as celebrated as Hans Zimmer? Hans has 11 Academy nominations and has one Oscar for The Lion King. Um, Danny Elfman has four nominations and hasn't won an Academy Award yet. And it's strange because they're both highly prolific composers, but it seems to me that Danny Elfman being the lighter type of composer and Hans Zimmer with the heavier subject matter, isn't that a bias? It's almost as if the Academy is saying, well, we're going to award someone who's dealing with the heavier, more dramatic type of movies, as opposed to some of these lighter, more diverse types of of films, which in some respects may even more challenging to write music for. So, you know, why hasn't the Academy awarded Danny Elfman uh, for some of his great uh, productions and and the orchestration by Steve Bartek? And finally, I'd just like to say that I hope that young composers and -and up-and-coming composers resist the temptation to always fall back on loops and rhythmic patterns. You know, can we get out of this Philip Glass mode and just get on with it and just write music from the heart. We're not machines. We shouldn't be confined to rhythmic patterns and loops, which are anything but liberating. I mean, why lock yourself into a cell? Get out there and explode out of the shell of rhythmic confinement and just take it somewhere else for the sake of diversity, if anything. Anyways, I'd just like to say in summary that I really enjoyed both master classes. They are well worth the investment, and you can learn a ton from these two prolific, 
highly successful composers. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the Ricky Molina YouTube channel, where I'll be coming up with some more product reviews such as this, uh, some tips on production, as well as some original songs and pieces that I come up with along the way. Thanks again. Stay well. I wish you all the best.